A truth seeker is not concerned about honesty from others. Rather, a truth seeker cannot allow themselves to deceive anyone, including themselves. That was a quote that I found online that I liked. <clears throat> Introduction. This is the foundation, the jumping off point. This section of the book was important because without this, I don't think this trip could have been possible or we could have been as fearless or done as much as we did. <coughs> as horrifying as it is. And yeah, it's all true. I tried to be as clinical as possible. I stood on a pile of flattened trash in front of the refrigerator, stained and covered with ancient sticky handprints. Papers and smashed cardboard boxes, curled dry from the spillage of past liquid food, slippery magazines and discarded junk mail covered the floor of the kitchen. Broken parts of toys and other metal objects and clothing littered the carpet of trash. Rotting food and more trash bubbled up out of the black plastic contractor bags. The odor mingled with odors of grease, feces, and mold. The walls and baseboards were disgusting. Gooey black grime thickened on the edges of the floor and in the corners of cor counters, cabinets, and fixtures. Brown stained drips and splatters of crusted food on the ceiling. Fingerprints and handprints marked the walls and accessible furniture. Our house is messy. That's what I was taught to tell friends when they wanted to come over. Although they had stopped asking a long time ago. Did the kitchen nook have walls papered with little yellow flowers? Was the Formica counter blue? I don't remember. The counter for the sink and the dishwasher that long ago stopped functioning separated the kitchen into two areas. The breakfast nook and large window overlooking the raised cement patio and backyard were obscured by dirty dishes, food encrusted pots and pans, jars and plastic containers that were stacked and perched on every inch of counter space, encroaching the range, teetering up to the level of the upper cabinets over the sink. Chairs were thrown and piled high on the table in the inaccessible nook, also filled with large boxes and trash. A white bookshelf in the middle of the kitchen loomed to my right. It held more papers, more discarded mail, more trash. I found a random paycheck stub of my dad's once. I was shocked at how much he was paid. Today, I contemplated the encrusted refrigerator in front of me and wondered, why is the bookshelf in the middle of the room? Because it used to be against the wall. Family meals were infrequent these days, although growing up, my dad would make something extravagant on Sundays like fancy pork chops, chicken cacciatore, lasagna, sauerbraten, or some wonderful soup or stew. He was a gourmet cook. We grew vegetables in the garden out back. We grilled steak and chicken on the back cement patio in the warmer months. The oven behind the bookshelf didn't work anymore but there was a time when it would regularly bake up a batch of family-sized fish sticks or brownies. Sukiyaki stir-fried in the electric wok was one of my favorite meals. There were two functioning burner elements on the filthy encrusted range. We boiled water in huge restaurant-sized pots to haul upstairs to the pink bathroom for our baths. We'd take turns with the pink porcelain bathtub, reusing the bath water. Those pots were heavy, but I like to be the first run in with the fresh, clean water. My youngest brother, Alex, once reminded me of the time I had tripped up the stairs. The boiling water poured over my chest and stomach, scalding my skin. I had forgotten about that. I was good with cold showers these days. I spent high school winters in that bathroom. 
curled up with an electric heater. I use the pink porcelain toilet with, my, with the lid down as a desk to do my chemistry homework. The bathroom wasn't as messy and I could kind of clean the toilet and the floor. I like the pink checkered tiles. I slid around on the floral notes of the talcum powders that dusted everything. The sink counter and mirror were filthy, covered in a slippery film, grimy scum and trash. Empty bottles, empty boxes of dental and toiletry products, empty prescription bottles, and cardboard paper toilet paper rolls. The room smelled of emerald perfume, talcum powder, and comet. Best of all, the pink bathroom had a door I could close. I stuffed the hole where the doorknob used to be with wadded up paper and washcloths. We had no central heat or hot water. I'm not sure what happened to the heat. It broke. But the hot water burst several years ago, flooding what we called the the laundry room and the wa and the wood paneled rec room. Garbage bags spilling clothing and trash floated up to the top stair, settling over the boxes into a thick sludgy pool. When the first Star Wars <clears throat> was released, I was startled by the similarities of the trash chute scene to the rec room of my parents' house. I had suspected for some time that I'd be trapped if I slipped down the stairs. Seeing Star Wars spun a new horror on the nightmare. Who knew what unseen forces would suck me under? I imagined sludge monsters slithering around under the mess, circling the antique black upright piano I had never learned to adequately play. It was down there, disintegrating in the muck. The rec room was one of the first rooms in the house to become inaccessible. The dining room, living room, and most of the kitchen were now impassable, filled with broken and unbroken furniture, animal feces, stacks of unread, saved newspapers, several copies of the same issues. More garbage bags of clothing and more boxes eventually blocked the front door. Of the two paths that were navigable, one led through the dining room and out the back door, and the other went up the stairs to the bedrooms and bathrooms. The second floor landing was mostly blocked off by a large chest of drawers. It was tricky getting the large pots of hot water around it. We moved sideways. In addition to the pink bathroom, on the second floor of this split-level suburban house was my parents' bedroom and my dad's office. The scent of pipe tobacco and cigars permeated Dad's office, adding to the warmth of this sanctuary. Tall metal shelving, floor to ceiling, held his well-cared-for, alphabetized vinyl LP records and reel-to-reel -reel tapes of classical music. The volumes of encyclopedias, dictionaries, medical literature, and other books gave the room a semblance of organization, even with the dust scattered coins and trash that littered the shelves and the floor. When he wasn't at work, Dad was usually sitting in the creaky wooden office chair in front of his small wooden desk, piled high with books and papers. He blasted his music and, or wore headphones and blew smoke rings. He air-conducted invisible symphonies, performing the collected works of Mozart, Tchaikovsky, Shostakovich, and Beethoven. Tyrannandot by Puccini gave us the names of the three kittens my dad, my cat Sneakers birthed, Ping, Pang, and Pong. They were often the subject of dad's photography hobby. On Sundays, John Philip Sousa and Spike Jones in the city slickers erupted from the office speakers and marched absurdly through this house of garbage. Carmina Burana was played so often, I got to know the Latin lyrics and the names of the top performers, Lucia Pop being dad's favorite soprano. Her version of Dulcime sends chills up my spine. Mom loved to sing along to Totus Floreal. New Orleans jazz music and obscure folk spirituals were other favorites in my dad's extensive library. He sang baritone, hitting the lowest notes through his nose and belly, transitioning easily to tenor and alto tenor.